Welcome to the Broken Lens Podcast. This is Adam Stutz. And I'm Heather Watson. How are you? I'm doing all right. Good. We are officially in summer, so that's... Hot. Yeah. It is It is very warm right now in, in Los Angeles. And I would say that we're arguably getting uh, probably the better end of the deal as opposed to like the rest of the country right now, which yeah. is broiling yeah. in certain parts. So, you know, so we can complain all we want about our mild... 80 degrees um (laughs) 90 degrees or whatever and stuff but there are parts of the country parts of the world where Mm -hmm. people are dying um uh on a lighter note (laughs) yeah um so what are you watching right now um this is maybe slightly embarrassing and i'm not sure why i'm exposing myself but i've been watching um twitch streams lately of people playing video games specifically i've been watching thomas middleditch uh he plays on role play servers for different video games and so i've been watching him play like red dead redemption 2 or red dead online or something he also streams i think yesterday he streamed for like eight hours it's really he spends like a weird amount of time for somebody that you know has work but um, yeah but yeah, so I've been watching a lot of stuff on Twitch. Cool, cool. But yeah, I think I think you have quite a different answer than I do. Yeah, I've been I've much more, I guess, traditional television. Yeah. Um, uh, we started this series on Hulu last night um, called The Perfect Wife. Uh, unfortunately, my wife fell asleep, but I watched <laughs> all the way through to all three or four episodes. Okay. Um, and it is just insane. When you get to the ending, like, it's just totally crazy. Okay. So, um, and then I'm also, we've been watching uh, Presumed Innocent on um, Apple TV, and, and that's been um, very entertaining. So, a lot of. A lot of really great actors and actresses who are just chewing up scenery left and right. So it's been pretty, it's been pretty good to watch. So hmm. highly recommend it. Okay. Yeah. So uh, for this week, um, I interviewed you know Scott and R.C. Thomas. Um, R.C. is our first international interview that I did. He um, is based in the U.K. And uh, I thought we had a really great conversation. He talked about just being exposed to different writers and and how the music scene has impacted his um, writing and uh, how being a father has impacted his writing. And um, he writes uh, very candidly about his experience um, dealing with brain cancer at a very young age. And um, and it was just a really great conversation. We ended up getting into the weeds on a lot of uh, music stuff during the course of the conversation, and and I, I just really enjoyed talking to him. He was he, he's a um, great guy. I really enjoyed the poem that we published, um, where he basically wrote the poem out uh, like a log, and it's essentially of him coming in and out of anesthesia but it has so many layers and um, it's very surreal heart-wrenching but it's also very funny at points and um, so he has a lot of textures and things at play and I I just really really enjoyed it and then uh, Zeno Scott um, was another wonderful interview I first met Z at a performance that he did at the Poetic Research Bureau. This was close to two years ago now, and and, um, he's fantastic. He is a a multi-talented performance artist, um, poet, musician, um, woodworker. I mean, just uh, very much a, you know, Renaissance person and, and, uh, has his hands in so many things. And one of the things I loved about Z's writing is that it's so distinctive. He writes in this incredible, uh, almost like phonetic, uh, way. And it, it just has this incredible music to it. And, so many layers and you can see um when he reads and performs it it, he's very much embodying the language that he puts on the page and so um so i'm really glad that we we had the opportunity to to do that yeah i found both of these interviews listening to them pretty inspirational honestly both of these people are multifaceted in terms of their artistry they they touch like you said you know music and illustration and um, all these other things outside of just writing. And I think it was just interesting 
as a creative person myself, hearing them talk about uh, how they've gotten through um, blocks or hurdles or, or whatever it may be in terms of their creative practice. And it was just this kind of thing that reminded me it's something you know but like something that reminds me just to like sit down and do it Mm -hmm. um so it's just like a an interesting perspective yeah um and i i think that uh another aspect of the conversation that that i enjoyed was just to your point like how we touched on so many different disciplines yeah and and how all those things kind of fuse together yeah that was the other thing too is that they i mean you ask this question so much in in these interviews of um you know how does how do these other things that people do end up inspiring their writing and for me i (laughs) i don't really think about where my inspiration comes from or you know how that how that takes form in the different things that i do and that kind of reminded me that maybe I should be looking inward as to why I'm doing the things that I'm doing. And maybe that would lead to more inspiration yeah. if I was actually, you know, paying yeah. attention to what was going on. Because, I mean, both of them had answers to those questions. Mm-hmm. And I don't know that I would. So. Yeah. And I, I feel like for myself, like thinking back to those conversations about talking about different disciplines, oftentimes, like I can get into a bit of a rabbit hole with like reading and Mm -hmm. and everything and just staying very focused on poetry but both of them demonstrate this incredible aptitude for multidisciplinary exposure and I think it's such a great uh you know just it's such a great approach to writing and it's certainly something that like I want to be able to employ in in my own practice as well and it definitely takes effort like you have to actually go out and you know Mm -hmm. find those things yes and put yourself outside of your typical boundaries absolutely so good reminders all the way through. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, here is my interview with Zeno Scott and R.C. Thomas. All right, Zeno Scott, welcome to the Broken Lens podcast. I'm so glad to have you here. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I was wondering if we could start off by reading Tea Half or To Make Breath Where We Shouldn't from Issue 2. Yeah, I would love to. Um, Let's do it. Tea Sub Half or To Make Breath Where We Shouldn't. Time to take stock, as in live, alive us, an inventory so far from living a certain liquidity of life. A decay nearing blues where cogito is just a fragment, I think. Therefore, I am made 2D again, again, made Vanta Black. Oh, sorry. You wanted my color as capital, as in the state, as in the punishment, as in the sentence, as if. As in, as if to be were simply a grammar, as if black couldn't modify beast, simply sibilant beast beat, beating my raw taut hide, a land mass in a sea swell keloid. Our sweet aroma whiffs of prerogative buoyant in a saline wave wash our bodies. The perverse thought we had sunk to new depths, though we had simply died again, dragged from Drexian ghettos and stuffed to the gills to be dined on. Let us be. Cause Big Floyd gurgled, I can't breathe underwater. And later a wave hit shore and simply ebbed again. I love that that piece. Um, Thank you. There's such a remarkable, distinctive musicality in your language, and there's this incredibly complex syntax that moves down the page, and each word is cascading um, over one another as though they're dripping down um, through the white space. And you're playing with such a rich mixture of dialect and persona, and there's this incredible inversion of perception where you're utilizing different font sizes and 
cases, um, almost like the voice of the speaker multiplies and layers and ebbs and flows. I believe in uh, possibly one of our email exchanges, you had mentioned, you know, how the work of Josh Charles has had an influence on your writing. And I'm thinking specifically of field and Josh's use of dialect in that work, which is like an inversion of Old English and, and Chaucerian English. And I'm just wondering, you know, if maybe you could elaborate for our listeners, like how, how did you conceive of this method of writing, writing your poems? Yeah, I mean, Josh Charles is huge. And then also Julian Berlaski, Tolomantes Berlaski, probably are the two contemporary poets, I would say, that really helped me conceptualize what I was trying to do. I think both of them have a much more <laughs> studied like etymological background than I do. My etymological education is like Wikipedia based. <laughs> I'm fascinated by it and like I've always really been into it, but it's not something that I've studied in a way that's very serious. And I think also it fits my specific positioning in comparison in community with them being a black Afro-Latino person where language <laughs> you know, like land, like all these other things is like such like a nebulous entity that is like stolen from us and given to us at the same time. And um, I'm also Dominican, which I said Afro-Latino, but Dominicans, I think if anyone knows, have a very particular way of speaking Spanish. That's like that people comment on regard across the Spanish speaking world um, because yeah. it's such, you know, people say broken and that's one of the words I would use, but that feels wrong, but it's such a, different dialect when mm -hmm. people are really um really you know dominican and like speaking in this this way that just nobody else can understand almost and growing up it's been really interesting because i don't speak spanish and i i haven't mm. for a long time i actually did when i was younger and forgot it on lock like on the way or lost it whatever and so a lot of times hearing particularly dominican spanish even when i took spanish in school i couldn't understand what anyone was saying uh -huh. in my whole family yeah. And so people would be around me and I'd be like, what are they talking about? And so eventually <laughs> like that was like a very physical like representation of language just being sound. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, like, and, but like also having meaning, right? Like I could understand my grandma's tone, even if I didn't understand exactly the words, I could understand what I needed to do, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. All that to say that I also like find myself taking on the language or like the accent Mm -hmm. of my family and the people around me um in a way that feels from lack you know of mm -hmm. my own dialect um, especially growing up in like a white area and so yeah it's just been a really big journey long journey and still continuing journey trying to figure out how to just make language that is not english you know like it's not like french where all these letters exist but you only say three of the letters it's like what do you say and how do you spell that mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like kind mm -hmm. of a very simple simple thing where i try to do you know like add a little meaning into the way that i do it but it's like decay yeah yeah <laughs> you yeah, know yeah. and and i and the, and so i try to make a uniformity of that um and i'm trying to create that as i go on but of course it changes depending on what comes before or after the words yeah. and stuff. I think when I when I read your work, it's like I can I I feel almost like different parts of like my body jerking or you know moving, and so there there is this kinetic movement just like through throughout the language, and I I I think that it's interesting. Um, the pieces that that we published are are fairly long, and I and I'm interested in finding out. Do you do you feel like longer works are more effective for your voice? It's so like, honestly, it feels so good to have someone think of my word work as being long. Cause I've always <laughs> for so long been like, I got three lines. Like I got a haiku in me right now. And I don't know what else to tell you. Like I would, my first self-published book, there's maybe one or two poems that are more than a page. Like, and mm -hmm. by a page, I mean a stanza on a page, you know? <laughs> and, yeah. um, so it feels, it's interesting because I, I haven't really thought about my work getting longer. But it has. Um, and I know we're going to talk maybe a little bit about the music stuff, but, you know, mm -hmm. especially getting into the music, I, these songs I'm making that are coming from the poems are like 15 minutes long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I can't, I can't mm -hmm. figure out how to make them shorter. 
Yeah. And I like, and they're slow and they're meditative in this way that is like completely antithetical to like what I usually do in both my music and poetry. So it's really interesting to see how when they come together, they're like negate themselves to become very slow and droney. And I kind of forget the question. <laughs> but, <laughs> but just, um, well, I mean, just the, I, you know, I feel like some, some poets will start out with a kind of desire to write longer works and stuff like for example and i don't want to i don't want to say like epic but you know but like they have this ambition to you know write like book length works and they want to they want to be able to proceed with kind of this much longer runway for for their language whereas you know i know for myself when i write you know i can sometimes i can barely eke out a line and and that in of itself becomes a thread which will ultimately kind of get sewn into this larger um almost disparate like tapestry but then it, like kind of you know it somehow fuses together and, and, you know, takes on a life of its own. Um, and so I, like, for me, like, it's just a, it's just a fascinating idea is like whether or not you go in like with, uh, you know, arguably like a plan or if it's just kind of like, a, you know, unfolds like on its own. Yeah. I mean, I think that this kind of gets to a question I wanted to ask you about reading my work, but mm -hmm. I very much work out loud and mm -hmm. I hope that my work is read that way. And I was wondering how you read it, if you read it out loud or... I, I did. I read it out loud. I read it. I read it quietly, you know, sans sound and stuff, because I sometimes I like to hear the way my, my interior voice works with writing and stuff. Like it'll enunciate certain words differently. And then reading back and like reading it out loud and seeing how the lyricism like will punctuate certain points differently when I'm using my actual voice. And that's a great point that you bring up because I know when I write, sometimes I get trapped in the echo chamber of my head and yeah. and I can't hear it, you know, because of my, uh, my ADHD and like my, you know, my neurodivergence and stuff, everything gets very, very loud in my head and I have trouble getting out of it. And so sometimes I end up, you know, trying to recite like what I'm doing or, or reading it back and then realizing like, oh, my God, that does not work at all. And yeah. Like, you know, yeah. the echoes like the echo gets like, condensed and then like I can finally start hearing that singular voice again and I know how to change it. So. Um, so, yeah, going going back to kind of like your original question. Yeah, I, 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 I did both. I like to approach it in both ways, yeah. um, both silently, like with that interiority, but then also being able to say it out loud. And I think it's an, you know, it's an important distinction that, that, that you're drawing. Yeah, I mean, along with that, I think another person that is a huge inspiration that I forgot to mention is Nathaniel Mackey. Mm. Um, kind of like the real, real jazz language, really yes. just like the way he forms a sentence to make a rhythm that, I don't know, the way he works is so crazy. And yes. um, I think that he has really influenced a lot of the way of my sentence structure mm -hmm. in the four and in a way that I, I don't know if he thinks about it rhythmically or if it comes out that way, but I'm noticing that it just comes out that way. Mm -hmm. um, like I'm mm -hmm. not trying to be rhythmic and that's something with the music that's been so interesting where I'm like, oh, it rhymes already. Right. I didn't yeah. even know it rhymed. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's like, I just put to music and the way I say it and then all of a sudden I'm like, holy shit. And I, and I, you'll see it when we get to the, the song, it's like barely any words have to change. And it's not music that's like very off kilter, you know, without a lot of rhyme and like all that kind of stuff. It feels like kind of, you know, normal melody. And and in regards to the way that it works in my head, I think in terms of like the brain jarble with like what comes before it and what comes after. My the other big influence is in my in my poetry life is that I started doing something called elocution. Have you ever heard of that? No, no. no. Um, like in high school, it's a thing called poetry out loud. And so you would mm. go and do these competitions where you would recite poems that were famous and you had to recite them by memory in like a theatrical way. Oh, and like that's what I did before okay. I ever even started really writing poetry was mm -hmm. memorizing because um, I have a terrible memory other than memorizing lines, lyrics, and things like that. I can remember mm -hmm. them like one go. And so I think that one thing that I do also, which I did when trying to memorize, was every new line, I start over. Like I read from the top mm. every time there's a new line. And like after I add the new line, I read from the top. And it's like a very kind of like again and again and again kind of like mm -hmm. uh, almost like factorial process, it feels like yeah. in some way. 
And so that I think really affects something because that in that way, similar to when I write raps, which is something that I do a lot, you have to like restart the beat and redo it. Cause like that one syllable, you have to figure mm -hmm. out how to say it right so that you can get to the next line in time. And I think that that's something that just is happening maybe naturally. I'm not sure, but I, I don't think about it. And I think it's fascinating when I notice it after the fact. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you were uh, recounting your work like that, that reference back, because those are the layers that you have in in your work. And I think that that's also, you know, true of your performance work. Like I saw your performance at the Communicator Series in, in March here in Los Angeles at PRB, and and it was extraordinary. I mean, it was this heart wrenching performance and you. you had such incredible physicality and dealt with, I mean, just like heartbreak, loss, death. I mean, just so many big themes like that were that were placed into that. And, and even in the ways that you would call like blackout to, you know, to the folks that were working in the lighting and stuff. I mean, it was it was remarkable. And, um, and there was and there was this incredible just, you know, again, it was it, it was these layers. And I, I am curious, you know, like you, you mentioned with the Poetry Out Loud and, you know, do you feel like your performance work influences your writing and vice versa? Or do they do they kind of like operate in separate spheres? Um, it's like this is kind of like an existential quandary for me, like putting together, commingling, you know, all of the different ways that I like to create work. And I think it's taken me a weirdly long time to get to theater even though I like grew up with theater and did theater growing up, but like I, it wasn't, I was like, I couldn't write plays. I couldn't figure out how to write a play because I don't write narratives. Mm. Like I don't write stories. I don't consider myself a storyteller. <laughs> I consider myself a poet. Mm -hmm. um, and every time I've tried to write a story in any capacity, I get really discouraged mm -hmm. and like very much like, but then what is supposed to happen? Like, what am I supposed to do? Okay, I have all the characters. Now what? <laughs> what do you mean a cod? I'm like, what do you mean a cod flake? I'm like, what do you mean it has to come at this time? I'm like, I don't know. I would just get so confused. Yeah. And I could never finish. And I really, it was a hard part of my MFA because I tried to do screenwriting and speculative fiction and all that shit. And I couldn't do any of it. <laughs> um, so I'm not a storyteller. Um, that being said, I did, I wrote my first play, I guess, the first play I put on for my thesis in undergrad. And that was just me taking poems and making them into a script. To answer your question, I think that my writing has really influenced everything else, the music, the mm -hmm. performance, because the writing gives me the text. Mm -hmm. And then I think from there, I'm able to like putz my way through, like figuring out <laughs> the, the surroundings of it. Cause I, I say putz because I'm like very much not trained in guitar. I would not have known so because when I saw you play at stories, I it was not I, that didn't that never crossed my mind. I was like, I was like, Jesus, there's another multi hyphenate thing to add to your your incredible uh, repertoire and stuff that you I'll have. take the hyphen, but I'm like really <laughs> trying to work on getting the chops together. Um, but I'm like trying to as Diane Cluck, who is this amazing songwriter I love says work with the chops you have. Mm. Um, yeah, I think the writing has just been the foundation for so much. I think the reason why I don't focus as much anymore on trying to be a poet that's like published on the page is because honestly, I don't think enough people care about written work and written poetry or like I don't think there's enough infrastructure anymore to like, like, yeah, I don't know. Like, I don't want to put on any more zines. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I don't want to do any more self-publishing in this way. I want to do things where it like feels like I'm getting acknowledged, sure. you know what yeah. I mean? And yeah. I think that like writing in the poetry world is not giving that to me. And yeah. I don't find myself having fun at readings of poetry. I have myself having fun at like performance weirdo stuff and music performances. And so I think like trying to bring myself into those spaces feels more right than trying yeah. to like make a space in the page poetry world. Yeah. And I, I you know, it's, it's interesting because I, I think there's, uh, this false dichotomy that's definitely been drawn between what's often derisively referred to as performance poetry and then, you know, more sedate academic reading. Slam. Yeah. Yes. As white people love to say. Right. Black yes, people. exactly. <laughs> and I, you know, but I found that there, there's also, it's interesting because there's this tendency um, for, for writers often uh, 
white writers uh, to fall into this trap of using this almost flat affectation when reading. And and personally, for me, it drives me yeah. crazy because I, I feel it does a disservice to the language. Um, if the reader isn't able to bring a certain level of energy to their to their, you know, to their writing and and it's and it's honestly, it's there's a certain level of arrogance, I would think, to think that, you know, your writing is so good that you had don't have to punctuate it with you know with with some character yeah you know i i think of readings of like dylan thomas who obviously had like a flair for the dramatic but you know and for some people that's been regarded as being distracting and you know and just like a you know flagrant affectation but i find it very moving i mean i mm. i'm blown away by that and if i could you know work in like a tenth of the mode of that and stuff where i'm able to like kind of affect the energy that i want people to experience when they're reading my work by itself i don't see any issue with that and it's, so it's it's yeah. just a very uh it, it's almost frustrating in a way that people get yes. so hung up on these idiotic categorizations and yeah you know, and I and I, I don't know. I I've I've certainly struggled with that recently at readings where people just kind of it's very monotone and yeah. and you know and and it would be one thing I think if you were doing that for effect, but it's it's clearly it's not. It's just very frustrating for me as a as an audience member, but also as a writer, I I find it very uh, dispiriting and discouraging. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I find it nearly impossible to listen to people, like just listen to words and understand them in general. Mm -hmm. Like I, that's my neuro, that part of my neurodivergence. I'm like, you mm -hmm. can't just tell me a sentence. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. I'm like, I can barely understand talking to people, literally. And <laughs> so I'm like, I definitely am not going to understand the words you're trying to say to me right now, mm -hmm. especially if you can't like punctuate them in some kind of like extra lingual way mm -hmm. that helps me understand like what you're trying to say. And yeah. I think that it also is really hard as a performer who brings like 110 mm -hmm. to every performance. Cause I, re I like, I rely on having performances to have a reason to wake up. And yeah. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Like yeah. I like, I look to perform cause I'm like, yes, mm -hmm. I will have something to do all day that will make me feel like my life has value. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, I work really hard and, like, I memorize it and I, you know, do all of these things or try to at least. And, yeah, it, it, it sometimes is hard um, to, mm -hmm. like, because it feels almost like my, like, I, it makes me feel like I'm doing too much. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> no, I feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah, um, yeah. And... And yeah, so it has, it is difficult in, in spaces like that. I think it's very much, uh, it, I think it's, it's based on these labels that have kind of created themselves where I think there is like this weird thing about not wanting to be a performance, like a slam poet. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I think people almost like do this anti cringe thing where they become very like chill and like matter of factly neutral, almost neutral, you know, like, yeah. I, I hate to say like neutral about yeah. these, in these poems. And I'm like, Damn, maybe it's neutral. Like I don't know. Yeah. I couldn't understand what you were saying. <laughs> and it's just it's just maddening because it's it's yeah. like I I want something. I, I need some type of fuck you energy, like in that yeah. in in that voice, and I want to be able to to feel it. I need some type of viscera in there. Yeah, I I get that the that there is a certain type of um I think affectation, especially that white poets. Who have done slam have kind of like turned it into this character like characterization and stuff that that is just it's like it's almost like we've drifted so far the other way that there's this kind of lack of awareness of like you need to bring energy to the to the language that you're, that yeah. you're sharing you know and and i i feel like it's like i want to try to give life to the to the words i put on my on on the page now I'm sure that when I read, I'm probably much more staid and probably a little more reserved and stuff when I read. But I, I am trying to do that. You know? Yeah, it, it only can help. I think it's I think I had an issue acting because of the cringe factor, mm. because of being like, I can't do that and be like serious <laughs> about that. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, when you're not serious, it's bad. And when you're serious it's good <laughs> and like well i'm not serious but you know when you take it seriously mm -hmm. even if it's mm -hmm. taken seriously doing something very stupid but like yeah. when you really do it and you eliminate that factor of like 
oh, is this going to seem like too much or contrived? Or it's like, if you're thinking about it, it is. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're just going to do that shit. And I think that, um, you know, I there there are definitely a few performances I can think of recently, but like few. Mm-hmm. And I th- that really like excited me and like made me go like, oh shit. You know, I'm kind of in this place where like my genre is whatever I've, something I've never seen before. Mm-hmm. Just, and mm-hmm. it can be the smallest grammatical thing. And, and like, there's a poet uh, and a friend of mine, Tivoli, Tivali, um, doll next door DJ, she's great, um, who she'll do these turns of phrase where she'll say, and she's a trans woman, and she said something like, they asked me why I didn't tuck my tail between my legs. And like, she'll do these really simple turns of phrase that like, and like do them again and again in different ways where I'm like, whoa, that was so simple what you just did. And it is crazy yeah, that you just yeah. did that. Um, yeah. And yeah, and I can just think of a lot of examples, particularly in her work, but in a lot of other ways. And, you know, and there's, you know, do you know Jeremy Kennedy, obviously? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, the first time I saw them, they were reading and I couldn't understand the word they were saying. And they were throwing the pages and they had the tea thing off their glasses. And then mm-hmm. eventually they took off their shirt and there was just a grandmother's bra that they were wearing. Like yeah. an old lady, big old bra. And yeah. I was like, yes! I was searching for them for 30 minutes after that. I was like, who is that? What is that? <laughs> and like, I didn't understand a word because like they were kind of bumbling in this weird way. And like, that to me is so much better than like monotonously saying every word in a way that I can hear it. Um, And so I'm just really excited that people are, I don't know, going all over the place. I feel like a lot of my friends who are sex workers do amazing poetry and their affectation is really good in their poetry. Like this really interesting, I can't even describe it, but like cam girl chat bot. I don't know. It's like such a really interesting way that people are are doing affectation based on what their poetry is about, the life they live and all this. Stuff. So, yeah. And there, there is, it's interesting that, that you mentioned that because um, MG St. Sparrow had recently done a performance uh, where they, had, they were reading, I, I believe from one of their recent books and they read this particular piece that was a, essentially a recollection of of an encounter but they read it in the flattest like most bored voice in the world and it was amazing like it was it was perfect and and it was such a sly dry move but it was so good and it was so effective and and in those instances i think it i think it works i think it's the people that tend to relegate themselves to this very just bland kind of You're like therapist <laughs> yes yeah yes it's like the music of of uh yeah. you know the elevator music of, of poetry I'm, you know i'm not i'm not hearing it and yeah, yeah. it's just and some people hard. can hear it which i envy some yes. people can really sit there and hear every word yes and yeah. that is not me and it's never been me and often i will like print out the words and hand mm. out booklets Cause I'm like, I know someone in here is not going to get it. Yes. Cause I'm like, I also am a teacher, you know, like I'm like, you have to give people audio visuals. You have to give everybody yeah. all these different ways to understand what's going on. Because the last thing I would ever want is for someone to not understand. They might not understand the concept, but I want mm-hmm. them to understand the word sounds that are coming out of my mouth. To revel 
listeners, that was a, a, a musical rendition of the Lack and Lacrimose, and um, that was gorgeous. Oh, it Thank was beautiful. you. Yeah, the, you know, it's interesting because um, it goes back to the uh, uh, earlier in our conversation. I was talking about the layers and some of the the notes that you were playing on the guitar remind me of um, almost like Endu Mokhtar, like this like Sudanese like like desert funk and stuff, and and really wonderful. I love how you layer everything together, and that I guess this this brings me into my next question because I I didn't know this about you. It's another another hyphen to add on, but. You're also a sculptor that works in wood and you do, do you do these wood pieces and they're gorgeous. Thank you. It's like a, it's a hard hobby to keep up, but I definitely love it. Again, it, it ties into the layers of your work. I mean, you know, you're, you're physically layering pieces of wood together. And, and, and I, I, I guess when you think about it, do you feel like almost like it's kind of um, a natural extension of your work as a writer, as a musician, as a performance artist and stuff that you have this tactile, uh, you know, medium um, that you're that you're working in where you're you're building layers. And it seems I mean, it seems like to me, like almost like a logical extension. Yeah, thank you so much for asking about that. I appreciate that. And, you know, it's hard sometimes to identify as a woodworker, especially because or someone who works with wood even because uh, I, I, I went to woodworking school after getting briefly suspended from college uh, for a good reason, not a bad reason. And I went to a woodworking school where people were doing like really meticulous furniture making. Mm. And I was like, so I came here to make like a conceptual art piece. I'm not <laughs> sure if you all are familiar with that, but they were like, the craftsmanship on your piece is so ass. Like they hated me. They were like, and they were like, this is not woodworking. This is something completely different. And I was like, exactly. I am not doing what you're doing. A hundred percent. I'm not doing that. Um, yeah. Um, they were like making secret drawers and shit where you're like knocked over here and like came out <laughs> over there. Like, you know what I, I was like, I'm not doing that. I, the first piece that I ever made in a large scale way was um, a table called Middle Passage actually, which was like completely just about like what the materials were. I feel like woodworking and also like how I treated the materials. I found this amazing live edge piece of walnut, black walnut that had bullets in it because someone had shot mm -hmm. the tree. And then I got like this like poisonous African wood, which like, honestly, I don't even like that people use it because of the mm. way that people get wood from Africa. But like, that was the point, you know what I mean? Like kind of vibes. And it was a really beautiful experience. You know, I never really thought of it as, I guess I wouldn't think of it as like a natural progression. I think mm -hmm. that it was actually, it almost felt as though the being a poet became too is the word cerebral, like became too of my brain, right? Like mm -hmm. became too heady. And I was searching for things like drawing or this or that, that felt actually a lot more, I wouldn't say intuitive. I wouldn't say, because woodworking is actually kind of unnatural because wood mm -hmm. actually has so many rules to it um, mm -hmm. that like, but it's also interesting because as a woodworker, you have to respect those rules or the wood mm -hmm. won't comply to what mm -hmm. you want. For example, like the end grains of a piece of wood will never glue together or, you know, things like that. I, I think that that's interesting. And I, and I think that it reminds me of grammar a little mm, bit. You know mm. what I mean? I think that similarly, the way I was woodworking was very crude and like rudimentary in a way that had meaning to me. Mm. And that's like sometimes how I feel about the way that I'm creating language, like very like, it's not that complicated. Maybe the content is complicated, but like the language structure is often more simplistic than people think it is. They often, mm -hmm. when they read it, they try to do something with the language that is not what it's doing. It's And it's also like, I wish there were a way to change the poem based on, well, I guess it would just be writing it in normal English, um, based on how everybody else said it, right? Like, mm. But doing that thing with the language based on everyone's individual personal mouth <laughs> mm. and, um, and like the way that their mouth says it. Yeah, there's a simplicity to the way I was woodworking in a kind of genre that's really complex and in a way that people disliked and like, like the teachers really liked it but the students did not <laughs> and so it was very much like it felt similar to me as to how i feel in like the world of writing in some ways for sure and i i think that's the thing is that you 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 said that the the language is simplistic but i think it's the 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 arrangement of the language and the execution of the language and how you build it out and 
And for me, I think that's one of the signs of truly great work is where it's deceptive. There's a deceptively simple concept that all of a sudden you just like turns on its head and then turns you on your head. And then all of a sudden you're like, holy fuck, like that's that's incredible. Like this just blew my mind open. And that was the Thanks. experience I had when when I saw you read it at PRB because I was just sitting there going like, Oh my God, like this, I've never experienced something like this before. And that, you know, again, visceral, like elemental, like reaction was like, this is, this is like, you know, this is great work to me. So that that's the thing Thank that you. like really kind of, you know, drives it forward. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've had so much issue like with the form that I've like created for myself feeling legible mm. in a way that's like not legible as in, Sam I am or Cat in the Hat, <laughs> but like legible as in like Ulysses. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Legible yeah. as in like people are confused enough and yeah. not enough that they are like willing to keep going. Yeah. And yeah. um what I've struggled with also, like in the era of people saying black bodies, which I hate, is needing my black body to always be present. Some like mm. feeling that way for the work to feel to feel received. And like feeling as though people of all types, all race, you know what I mean? It doesn't have to just be white people, I mean, but all types of people like have trouble reading it. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and I've watched it happen. I've sat with people and said, Can you read it? out loud for me really quick what happens really interestingly is i remember reading it with a friend of mine who's grew up in south africa speaks like afrikaans and all these things and it sounded like afrikaans when they read it like they would not make it like they couldn't form the english words they could only mm -hmm. form these syllables that to me sounded like afrikaans and then I saw like someone else read it who was like, I don't know, like their family background was kind of like Scandinavian. And then like there were some parts of it where like it just like transformed in this way because it wasn't, they couldn't read the English that was mm. underneath it. So they mm. just kind of created these like celeb, like it's like an AI. Have you ever seen an AI picture depict language? Yes. Yeah. And, and it's, it's not actually words. Yeah. But it's cool. It's like these things called, like, I think it's called artifacts, maybe. Mm -hmm. But it's like they just take bits of letters from other images to create. Oh, and you can read it, though. You yeah. can tell yeah, yeah. What, it's, what it's trying to say, but it's not. And it doesn't yeah. say that. And, yeah. And I, I really, like, fuck with that. And I've been working a little bit with AI, which has been, like, kind of crazy. <laughs> but, yeah, I think that it's just been... It's just been a whole thing trying to figure out, like I texted Julian Verlaski, who I love, because I've like reached out to my, I'm very much like, where, where are my idols on Instagram? Because mm -hmm. usually my idols are not that famous, which I love. <laughs> um, and uh, so we we talk a lot. They're like a really important mentor to me now. And I was like, should I just write the whole, my whole manuscript, which is written like these poems in regular English? Should I just do that? And they were like, no. Yeah. <laughs> no, of course not. I, I'm in agreement. I'm like, in oh. A thousand percent agreement with Julian. I, I absolutely so. Um, one last question. I, you know, you were living in Los Angeles up until very recently, and then you moved to the East Coast, and and I'm wondering, you know, how has place affected your writing? Place is not very important to me, or like doesn't like ring as. Place only is important in that there are certain infrastructures that are specific to certain places. But what what really has affected me is like the structure of my life and like the community of my life. Place has always felt like really nebulous to me. I've ne always like my bio says from no place, like capital yeah. N, capital P. I've never felt connected to a place in my life. Interesting. Fascinating. See, I cannot thank you enough for this conversation. This has been wonderful. Um, before we go, can you tell our listeners uh, where they can find you online and where to find your music? Cool. Yeah. Um, so I have an Instagram, which is kind of where I post a lot of like everything just because I don't like to spread it out and I just like to make a lot of videos. So my Instagram is mythnomer, M-Y-T-H-N-O-M-E-R. Um, and you'll be linked to other things through there if you try. Um, I also have uh, or had a post-punk band called Your Trash, Y-E-R Trash. We're on Spotify. You should check us out from college. We're, we're trying to get awesome. back together. <laughs> uh, see, 
Yes, thank you for for joining us, and I'm I'm looking forward to future conversations and seeing more of your work out in the world. So, all right, take care. Peace. R.C. Thomas, welcome to the Broken Lens Podcast. I'd like to uh, have you start um, by reading from a brain surgery patient's logbook. Yeah, cool. Thank you for having me. Okay, I'll read my poem uh, from a brain surgery patient's logbook. February 14th, 1997. 9 a.m. My submarine sinks. 9.22 a.m. It seems the batteries have been taken out. 10.30 a.m. These are depths not found in waking life. 10.44 a.m. I'm way down at the bottom now. 11.06 a.m. I'm in the blindest recesses of my mind. 11.53 a.m. A Mariana snailfish drags my submarine along my temporary seafloor quarters. 12.34 p.m. I acknowledge how it keeps the curtains closed. 12.35 p.m. How else would it be? It asks. 1.58 p.m. Well, some people let the light in, I argue. 2.11 p.m. It looks at me, gaunt with loathing, mulling over my use of the word light. 2.27 p.m. I tell it that it's dark down here, deep in my unconscious, but presume this isn't new information. 3.09 p.m. What a cliche, it replies. 3.11 p.m. Fear of the utter black, claustrophobic, feel the cold easily, it asks. 4.06 p.m. Well, none of this is usual, I say. 4.33 p.m. It tells me not to worry, that it's all done in a blink. The sun will have set below water surface level before you've realised it's no longer morning. 5.19pm. I ask to send a postcard to my loved ones. They'll be wondering where I've got to. 5.38pm. No time for that, I'm told. And it adds, no souvenirs. Here, in general anaesthesia, it says, we don't entertain the typical tourist. 6.05 p.m. I complain. You mean I've come all this way and I don't even get a lousy T-shirt? 6.28 p.m. You've got to go all in, it insists. Immerse yourself with the locals. Try the cuisine. Make pitiful attempts to wrap your tongue around our language. 6.59 p.m. Having finally become fluent in asking for a flashlight, the Mariana snailfish packs me into my submarine again. 7 p.m. I bob back up upon the surface, back to life's insane brightness. That's beautiful. What drew me to this poem was the way you definitely use the timestamps at the start of each line. It almost forms like a, a kind of anaphora, and it creates this rhythm and pattern like a clock counting down. And as the reader moves down the poem, an entire day unwinds parallel to the speaker and the speaker's surreal dialogue with the snailfish. And there's an entire parallel world that the reader moves through with the speaker, and it's it's a very well honed creation of tension between these mundane aspects of the timestamps um, or like a clock clicking down and this surreal um, at times comical but also terrifying movement through this darkness and I was wondering how did you decide on the use of this format for this particular poem did it unfold naturally or was it something that you know that emerged after a few drafts yeah it's sort of grew the idea kind of grew organically in the sense that I'd already written a poem 
and I wrote it a long time ago, maybe uh, seven years ago or so, when I first started writing these poems about my brain tumour, I thought it would be interesting uh, to write a poem from the brain surgeon's point of view. So I, it was a very kind of medically based poem, and it was uh, it was called From a brain surgeon's records hmm. so it was like he'd written in a notepad and he'd written just very the very kind of clinical sort of medical facts mm -hmm. of the operation but then with these kind of little um snippets of his own kind of personal confession or kind of insight into it as well so then when i was i came back to these poems over the last maybe couple of years i was starting to think about how could i bring this out from sort of the 20 pages that it had started out to a, a full collection and you know that because I know I've got so many memories and there's so much that happened for me in that time when I was 10 years old going mm -hmm. through this um, experience of having a brain tumour um, it was starting to find you know what where could I explore what could I get poems from and really you can get poem from anything and then this was actually one of the later ones that I wrote because I was like, I had all this stuff built up to the operation and all the stuff after the operation. But um, but because the actual operation uh, to go through, it's like a blip. Mm -hmm. you, you're unconscious. Mm -hmm. uh, you're deep under. But I, so then I said, well, wouldn't it be interesting to think about what what that would be like if you did actually experience something whilst you're under the anaesthetic? And then because I had that poem called from a uh, brain surgeon's records it just seems obvious then to go oh okay well i'll write it from my perspective mm -hmm, now mm -hmm. as uh, the one under the anesthetic if this was a real thing that happened it would be a such much more surreal experience than the clinical experience of being a surgeon if you know what i mean yeah and i i love the way that you crafted the character of the snailfish um there there's this wonderful almost a deadpan element to the snailfish that i really like and he or she has this incredible i don't know this this sharpness that unfolds and it's a wonderful element because i did find myself chuckling at certain points about the dialogue but also having certainly i i can't speak to having gone through something as as intense or scary as as brain surgery but um but having had um surgery a few years ago and being placed under general anesthesia and and, and certainly it was a very intense experience and coming out of it mm -hmm. and you know that kind of that moment of yeah you just just the countdown and then all of a sudden you're you're kind of back into the world and and it's a very yeah yeah it's it's a it's a strange and disorienting feeling definitely yeah it's a well it's a trip isn't it it's um it's the closest it, 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 it's a psychedelic trip yeah. in, in a way but um it's yeah, at the same time it's not because you don't have that you're not conscious so um but it's trying to recreate that kind of psychedelia and with the snailfish um it's really cool that you um felt that you know there was wit in there and and that sharpness came across because you know that was something i was um trying to achieve with like um the collection of poems that it, uh, this comes from there's all sorts of characters and by characters i mean uh bits of um hospital apparatus and things like this like an mri scanner a wheelchair a hospital bed the brain tumor itself um i give them their own voices within the collection and they all tend to take on this kind of uh, deadpan, kind of sardonic, sarcastic kind of um, attitude. And my reason for doing that really was because, well, it's just not a nice place to be, a hospital. And like I sort of went in trying to figure out well, what they, would they be like if I brought them to life? Well, I sort of feel like they would be a, have this kind of like careless kind of... Um, almost kind of callous kind of attitude mm -hmm. because oh well this is this is life isn't it yeah you know whereas you we're looking at it from going well now actually there's this whole world outside the hospital which is much more enjoyable and they're like no no no, no this is great right <laughs> yeah no that's it and the juxtaposition is great and i that leads me to my my next question that you've talked about that you're generally drawn to the surreal and the absurd and the abstract. And I was just wondering if you can talk more about why, you know, why you're drawn to that, that subject matter. Yeah. Um, I guess, well, I just kind of naturally gravitated towards writing 
that way. I, I I never started off writing anything other than absurd or surreal. And I wouldn't say my stuff is the most surreal. There's definitely more surreal stuff out there and more absurd stuff uh, for sure. But um, but uh, yeah, that's just kind of where I nat- naturally gravitated. And I have thought about it, you know, over the years, like why that is, what it is about surrealism. And I think it's um, I think it's the escapism that I get from it mm-hmm. and the ability that it gives you to flip things upside down and just look at things from a different angle, which the world doesn't necessarily give you otherwise it's almost like um surrealism forces you to twist things to 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 then um produce something which just wouldn't happen kind of organically uh laid out for you in day-to-day life Mm -hmm. and i think it's that interesting kind of um flipping of things uh which interests me i that that's that's all i can really say on it and just kind of by doing that i sort of feel that it gives a new understanding of the otherwise mundane kind of situation or you know something could be quite banal Mm. but then to sort of okay okay, let's uh put this for a surreal lens Mm -hmm. um or an absurdist lens um you can then sort of come away from whatever you've written and then when you read it and i still sometimes go back to my poems um and find things new meanings in them mm, you know that, mm-hmm. that had been developed because i've um because i've put them through this kind of surrealist filter yeah yeah absolutely i like that idea of kind of taking something that may be banal quotidian and then and then flipping it on its head the the poet james tate was was very adept at at doing that and kind of drawing right. uh absurdity out of daily life and, yeah. and um and especially in you know in the world that we live in right now and stuff i mean we we live in very surreal times and and yeah yeah in very absurd times and and you know and i tend to when i think of absurdity i, I go back to like um to camus and and that's like my touchstone for for the absurd and yeah. you know trying to take comfort and recognizing the absurdity in life and and then that kind of allowing you to have more freedom and to be able to experience uh, life more fully you know once you recognize how absurd everything is yeah you sort of um said what i was going to say really which is that isn't isn't life absurd anyway you know um it's absurd anyway aren't we just going around pretending that it's not really yeah. you know uh, you know when you think of it especially in sort of an ex on a on an existential uh, level, yeah, you know, really, and you start uh, pulling the layers apart. You know, well, what 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 we're doing here on this planet in this universe is is quite surreal and quite strange. <laughs> yes. Anyway, so yeah. to to write in a surreal fashion, re- in that sense, is only kind of writing the truth. You could say. Oh yeah, I and I I really like that. I like the idea of using surrealism as a way to get at the truth and and i think that that is a that's a that's a great observation um in addition to the longer lineated poems that you write you you also write haiku and i was just wondering if you could talk about you know what is it about the form that draws you in um and kind of how you were i guess like what drew you to um haiku in the first place like what was it that that drew you there so well what drew me to it in the first place was just getting into poetry in a big way um in my early 20s really that's when i started to get sort of serious about it you know wanting to learn it really learn it and read it and then just kind of reading all types of poetry so naturally i just i stumbled across haiku so to speak and just bought haiku anthologies and of course you know got into Kerouac's haiku that was you know an entry point for me really because it had this it had the thing I liked about poetry and prose at the time but it uh, yeah but he was doing it in haiku form Mm -hmm. and and it and you know he was quite unique for his time um obviously now there's lots of Kerouac uh ripoffs uh probably including myself (laughs) to be honest but um uh so that that brought me into it and then um and then I, I started to write it but I never really understood the form properly i thought i did but i was doing the whole 575 thing mm-hmm. uh, you know three lines 575 five, 17 syllables which is what we're taught at school and so understandably that's what uh most people understand it to be um but there's a lot more to it and you don't have to write 17 syllables or 575 
but yeah it took me a while to sort of work that out and when I did work that out I got a few published in little kind of journals um haiku journals and then because I was still writing um the the longer form poems um that just kind of took over because I was just working on books and then um and then life kind of took over and so I it was during the pandemic that I came back to it mm. um, because I hadn't, I had a writer's block where it was a mix of a writer's block and I was really unwell. I had lots of stuff going on in life and everything I was writing when I did write very sparingly was just, it, I just wasn't happy with anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was when I was, um, I was outside in my garden. I was actually, actually in my garage and I was doing something. And this is often when haiku will come to me. And they have over the years, I, I put one pops up in my head and often it will be in just a, you know, kind of a quick thing in my head. So one, yeah, something came up in my head and I thought, oh, that's a haiku. And then I remembered, oh, I've got that whole manuscript of haiku, which are a load of, they're just naff because, mm-hmm. you know, the most of them were written when I couldn't write haiku properly. Why don't I? Maybe that's my entry point back into get you know writing seriously again. Um, let I'm going to make a point of digging those out. So I dig them out, and then I just said to myself, right, you're just going to do this. You're going to put everything else, all your other writing to, that's really bugging you right now, and that you can't get into and you can't work out. Just put that to one side and just do this because this has a form, there's a structure, and there's certain um, criteria you have to meet. And I knew that manuscript was already quite heavy in nature, which is, of course, natural in um, haiku, but also um, actual kind of wildlife. So it's like, right, well, I'll just um, let me go through the manuscript and select, pick out all the wildlife haiku and see how many I've got and see, you know, there's maybe like 20 or so. So and then it's like, right, OK, let me just focus. I needed something to really hone in on, on mm-hmm. focus and focus my head like creatively. So it became this constraint which really helped me um so yes and and actually the the book that came out of it none of the original haiku that I'd written bar one actually survived because I jumped into the haiku community Mm -hmm. um, which is um you know a really active and engaging community and start buying the journals and start talking to other haiku poets just start to learn it to write it better so that Eventually, I would just, yeah, just write. I ended up writing a whole a whole new book, which was just much, much better than what I had. So that that's where it all came from, really. But it was, um, but it's interesting because now I've got, in, during that period, the, the haiku community is so intense and engaging. I actually, I've come out with three books of short form poetry, mm. sort of um, I, one haiku and two others are haiku related mm. uh, forms. It was almost like all this energy, this creative energy was just like, pouring out and yeah. then because I had because I'd got that creative energy of flow back into me that's when I started going back into those brain tumor poems mm. and bit digging those back up and said right well now I've got this I've got my mojo back sort of thing so let's um let's let's do this and it, and then and, and since it's just been every day now you know writing again which I I'd missed for so for a number of years to be honest I can completely relate to that I had just the most terrible time trying to write during the pandemic. I mean, it was, you know, two years, I I hit a wall. Yeah, I did not write really for the better part of two years. And I feel like forms can, because I, I don't, you know, write in form, but I, but I definitely feel like they can kind of draw you back out in a way because it gives you almost like a, a framework, a, a lattice. For me, the pantoum, is a form mm-hmm. that I really like because I like the repetition and and it's yeah. it's relatively simple that that kind of helped propel me back into into writing haiku is another another form senru yeah yeah um yeah it's definitely useful um you mentioned pantoum I've written pantoum years and years ago but I don't think I ever, I don't think I've ever published a pantoum I've never I don't think I've read it confidently enough but um proficiently enough but yeah and villanelles and terserimas mm-hmm. and sonnets um but you know I would, i'd never say i'm a master of um the form but um it's interesting or what i've noticed though more recently because i i I wrote yeah haiku collection um i have a hyben collection and then a tan renga collection which is um collaborative form mm-hmm. um it's like a tanka which is five lines mm. one poet will write, will write a three-line haiku and then the other poet responds 
uh, with a two line kind of capital verse and then it sort of shoots off into a different direction, which is fun. Um, so we have, yes, yeah, so myself and Hifs uh, Ashraf, who's a Pakistani poet, who's quite well known in, in the community, wrote like a dystopian kind of Tanranga collection. So that oh, kind wow. of gave me that kind of um, that bit of surrealism and experimentalism, which I liked. It was it pushed us both because it was um, it was it took us both in a direction that we hadn't quite gone in before. Like mm-hmm. I've pushed at the edges of that, but I haven't. Uh, it's got a lot more technical and involved in dystopia than science and technology than I've been I've ever done before. And and she'd kind of been doing more kind of spiritual and philosophical kind of stuff before that. So it was like this kind of it was almost this kind of escape. That let's just do something completely um off the wall sort of yeah, thing you know yeah. it, it, uh, with with a very traditional kind of um form um but yes to say in all of that i am um, i've been writing a lot of prose with poetry though just uh sort of finding myself gravitating towards the longer form again mm-hmm. which is not to say i i've uh, gone off haiku it's that's that will be there but it's almost like i've been sort of in this kind of box for a yeah, while and, yeah. and, and then it's given and it's almost like I needed to do that because now I'm sort of able to write these kind of uh longer forms again and you know I've got that creative energy to do to do that again and the drive to do that again so yeah it was those rules really that I just needed putting in place and I think that's for anything in life really sometimes we just need a little bit of grounding and a little bit of um you know those kind of guidelines whether it's you know to get up in the morning and you know walk your dog or whatever <laughs> it is you know otherwise it just doesn't it doesn't yeah. happen and for me to get to the point where I am now where I'm writing every day again which you know I, I really wasn't writing hardly at all for for years and then mm. to get to this point yeah I just it was almost like I needed that kind of strict kind of diet and routine and um yeah regiments of writing not just in a form but in a really kind of tight small form as well you know so it's yeah. really constrained yeah it's interesting too that you talk about the the act of collaboration because for me it brings back the exercise the exquisite corpse and which is very <laughs> much a surrealist exercise and and yeah, yeah. that has also been very generative for me when um working with other writers because it pulls us out of our comfort zone and often can be very funny and uh and bizarre and it will end up it almost like opens up other neural pathways like as we you know as the the poem continues to unfold and i i find it to just be a a really wonderful exercise when there's kind of like a a block of some kind yeah well yeah i mean yeah the um exquisite corpse i haven't tried that's something i would like to do it sounds because it sounds fun and in in general i've used forms if i've been stuck um how to get started on a poem then i then i have gone to you know okay let's just take the sonnet form and then you know all right i've got to write um however many lines and um you know and i've got to have a certain rhyme scheme and that kind of can drive the poem forward then because Mm -hmm. you've got to hit certain markers along the way but um the exquisite corpse sort of remind me of the Olipo um, mm-hmm. kind of writers, um, which I don't know huge amounts about, but their kind of um, rules or the games that they, they would have, like games yeah. that they would play um, in order to construct their writing or their poems. And um, I think was it was did the exquisite exquisite corpse come from the Olipo? I'm not sure. Uh, that, that... I feel like it was a um, product of the French Surrealists and okay. um, so like Breton and like his uh, coterie of, of writers and stuff that were kind yeah. of a part of that that movement. But I think, I don't know if the Olipo came out of the Surrealists or if it was uh, related to like the uh, Dadaists. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm not well read up in all the different kind of movements, so I have to be honest, because it, it gets a little bit confusing and it feels like there's some overlap um, with yeah. the different kind of subgroups of all these um, kind of movements. But uh, yeah, with the Alipo, I, I sort of remembered that I'd written a poem using an Alipo exercise, which was uh, to replace, uh, I'm trying to remember, it was t- to replace every noun, noun in the poem with something, it's something like the 10th noun in a thesaurus. Oh, wow. I think it was a thesaurus or a dictionary. So yeah, it was, or the ninth one, I'm, I'm making a hash of this, but you'd, so you'd have to look it up really. But um, it was something like that. And it was in a collection I'd published uh, a while ago. And um, that was really interesting because um, you had what was an interesting poem, but then yeah, just by replacing every noun 
to something and it, you didn't have a choice it wasn't like you get to uh however many nouns along in the thesaurus it was mm-hmm. and then go oh does that work doesn't it work it's like no it has to work it has to go in there mm-hmm. and then so, somehow it, it it made sense um mm-hmm. but it just ha- it just went off in all these kind of yeah. funny directions but it was a, it made it something which was kind of like average suddenly all the more interesting because it's just like, oh well, what what's what why is he use that word yeah, you know, yeah what um why is he referring to the midwife as like a horse eating hay or like it was like <laughs> which was just like well i wouldn't i wouldn't have written otherwise you right. know what I mean? <laughs> yeah but so, that's that's where it went but yeah absolutely um in addition to being a poet you're also an illustrator and a parent your illustrations also deal in kind of the surreal and the absurd i guess in many ways parenting can, times can feel surreal and absurd <laughs> and yeah i was just wondering if you could talk about how both of these roles as illustrator and parent also influence and, and impact your writing yeah um the illustration sort of came as just sort of another way to sort of um, express my express my ideas. Really, didn't really think I could draw to to any extent, and I would still argue that I can't. It's just like one of those things, like any kind of um, practice you kind of pick up. The more you kind of um, experience and absorb of that um, form so to speak uh in the sense illustration the wider your kind of knowledge becomes and the uh more well for, for me with illustration the more kind of different types of illustration i was seeing and then and then sort of being around other people that were drawing and just starting to doodle and then going oh actually i can just do like realizing that it's oh it's okay for me not to be a fine artist mm-hmm. like i can mm-hmm. just be I can just kind of do my own style and that just kind of developed what you've probably seen on my website I expect, mm-hmm. or Instagram. That's pretty much how I started drawing when I first started getting into it. Little bits of detail have like changed in, um, in my technique and things, but um, mm-hmm. not not huge amounts. That's just how naturally I drew. And once I sort of said, oh, it's OK to just kind of draw these kind of wonky drawings. And in mm-hmm. my mind, I was just like, well, this is how it should be anyway. Because I'd been sort of getting into sort of more DIY and kind of bespoke and sort of naive kind of illustration styles and mm. sort of realized, oh, that's a thing you can do and that's okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the whole kind of idea of having to draw like really accurately just kind of got thrown out the window. And then it was just, well, this is how this is how the drawing should be. So and then it was just kind of getting the ideas, you know, good enough for, to be able to sort of print them, you know, because they were mm. just quite loose kind of like the ideas that hadn't been quite pulled together yet. They didn't feel like print worthy yet. So it took a long time. And it again, like the writing for a while, like everything kind of went off grid and um, got diverted and it took me, you know, up until maybe sort of uh, five, six years ago where I started printing them or like thinking about sort of printing. And mm. um, because, yeah, because it was just like, all right, just get let me get back on this again. It's just picking up the pen again, mm. uh, just as like you with writing and just getting back into it. But um, yeah. But yeah, the two kind of bounced off each other a little bit with writing and illustration. Um, that's that it's just kind of unlocking that part of the brain which has those kind of uh, creative, kind of colourful ideas, which might then lend themselves to a poem and then vice versa. You know, um, you know, it's just about keeping that creative part of the brain uh, functioning and working. And you know, as long as it's doing that, then you know, ideas for different things will, will come natu- naturally. So. You know, I have books, a couple of books with um, both poetry and illustration in and the two Mm -hmm. kind of bounce off of each other. Like the haiku book uh, features illustrations of the animals featuring it. And, you know, I I reissued by myself uh, an old collection of poems and I sort of made these kind of montages where I drew kind of elements of the poems and just threw them all together on a page. So it's sort of like, yeah, this kind of like weird kind of uh, montage, like it's about 10 of them, black and white. Um, and then yeah, the parenting inspired a, um, I guess, a chapbook of um, poems called Zygo Poems, uh, which are published under uh, the name Richard Thomas. And so it, yeah, in that sense, that was just like a whole other kind of um, subject to go in on and explore, you know, poetically. Yeah. And it's just with anything, just like the uh, you know the brain tumor poems as well. It's just like, what does this look like as a poem? You know, taking every kind of little detail and situation in day-to-day life you know what does this look like as a poem and Mm -hmm. and then yeah that especially with zygo poems i mean with anything confessional you just kind of then uh reflecting on yourself it's you know you start to think about yourself 
at my role as a father and a parent and how my you know I was starting to think well how does my daughter see me and you know what is the world to her and um how is the world impacted by her herself you know yeah, and yeah yeah, so so all of those things, and I guess you know, and being a parent has definitely carried forward into my poetry now. Although I'm, you know, I've written that book, um, and at the moment I'm not writing about parenthood, but um, it definitely impacts your way of thinking. Be- I think that's for anything you're doing because you're just you've constantly got that thing on in the back of your mind. Well, I, I'm a parent now. I'm responsible for someone, and mm-hmm. and it changes your view on the world. So things that I write now, I probably wouldn't have written before I was a parent. Yeah, yeah. Because my head was in a different space. And some of the things that I've written, I wrote before I was a parent, I look back on now and go, well, that that doesn't feel like me at all. You know, like my views have changed <laughs> yeah. so much since then. Um, you know, and especially, I don't know, I guess, you know, the, like when you're younger, you tend to write it um, perhaps about things which... I don't know, but maybe considered cool and hip at the time. And then you get to be a parent and you go, it just feels kind of crass and kind of <laughs> like, oh, that wasn't me. Yeah. And like, and, and a lot of it is like, well, no, that really wasn't me. It was just me thinking that I, yeah. I had to, like I had to do that because I was a 23 year old artist, you know, and I, I had to, I had to write about that subject and that subject and yeah. I had to have this view and that view. And then, yeah. you know, as you get older and then parenting just kind of propels that, that kind of uh, maturing um, yes. of the creative mind. Like uh, it, it, that just increases with more speed, you know, yeah. as opposed to someone who perhaps wasn't a parent. I, I'm, I'm speaking from, you know, I don't know that obviously I don't. Yeah. I've only had the experience of being a parent, you know, becoming a parent. So Yeah, I was thinking that um, it's interesting that you talk about kind of the maturation process and going back and looking over old writing and and thinking about, you know, what might be, as you said, almost like kind of like crass posturing and then seeing how that changes and, and morphs as you get older and then factoring in children into the into the equation and I'm yeah. not a, a parent myself, but I'm an I'm an uncle and and have you know spent a lot of time with my nieces and nephews and 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 seeing the world through their eyes, which I think I think that's probably one of the coolest things, at least from a writing perspective, is that unedited, unfiltered kind of way of looking at the world and how that that manifests and how they draw all of these wonderful connections to things that as an adult you don't you know it kind of gets filtered out because we we have such a focused and and we train ourselves away from from looking at the world and kind of like making those wild leaps and associations and so like being able to like revisit that you know childlike uh yeah. curiosity is is something that i think is is wonderful and i could i could see that being a huge boon creatively yeah um i would say like anything i write now or draw i do think about always sort of subconsciously asking myself okay well how would my daughter view this mm. what would she think if she read this as a child what would she think if she read this as an adult in the sense that you know, i guess the you know, kind of cliche of you know children are the future you know, I have, you know, a lot of respect for my daughter and children, you know, of all ages, because, you know, they are yeah, there who are going to lead the way. So where does, you know, where does my creativity, where does my poems and my um, stories and my illustration sit um, according to them? And, you know, um, if my daughter was um, 21 and she was reading one of my poems, or one of my stories, what would her, what would her take on it be? And that, that, like, that's quite an interesting way. And that's not something I sort of uh, think about consciously. It's just there kind of in the back of my mind. It's not, it's only when I stop myself, I realise that, yeah, I'm sort of, um, she's almost like a, a sort of guidance counsellor oh, in, cool. in my in my, in my my process where, you know, before I go, right, this is done, I'm sort of putting it through her. Does this pass the test? Is this, is this okay? Like both in terms of technicality, but also in terms of the content and, you know, and what I'm saying and, and how am I, how I'm saying it and am I saying it in the best way and, and things like that. But it, it, you've got to be careful that you're not taken away from your own voice then yeah. because yeah. we, we are, as adults to still, you know, deserve to have our own voice and our views and opinions. Yeah. And of course you don't want to um sort of go so, so far over that you're just, um taking on the voice of the child do you know what yeah, i mean like yeah. um you you, you need to refre- uh, retain the kind of just a sense of yourself as well so it's a balance yeah. really i think 
Yeah, and I it's also funny because I, I was just thinking about my nieces and nephews are all brutally honest critics, so they, they, t- <laughs> they tend to be very, they can be very incisive and sometimes devastating with their criticism. Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, I'm bracing, I'm bracing myself with that. Um, my, my daughter, you know, she'll, she'll tell me if, you know, um, I'm not being funny in general like or i'm not you know i i've done or i'm I'm being an idiot but um (laughs) in terms of my creativity thankfully she's been just supportive so far so and just intrigued she's very she's been very curious and you know she's and she's got involved as well with writing poems and she got very involved with haiku and uh renge for a while with you know she had a friend who um in new zealand like a pen pal that she used to Mm -hmm. renge with um and she's sort of she's more of an illustrator she's the artist she can draw better than i can to be fair and she's yeah 11 so yeah oh wow that's her thing that's awesome um you also collaborate uh with musicians on your poetry and you've released two recordings in collaboration i believe with the artist veneer where you read from work uh this is from your collections i go poems and how does the collaboration you know with musicians influence your writing and do you have more plans to to collaborate with musicians um and are there certain genres of music that you feel like lend themselves well to reading poetry yeah um uh, collaborating with musicians sort of stemmed from my um background of being a musician Mm. um being like amateur rock bands when i was younger so it just kind of grew organically and i mentioned sort of um kerouac earlier who was kind of an early influence although i have sort of stipulations about kerouac these days because i've you know i've become a parent and your views change on certain types of some people but (laughs) Yeah, I've got one of the CDs um, and I used to listen to it all the time of him reading this haiku with, um, I think it was Steve Allen um, mm. on piano. And it was, it, it was all spontaneous and I liked that spontaneity. Um, he just went into the room, Steve Allen started playing piano and he just, he had, I think he had like a bag with all his haiku written on yeah. this piece of paper and just pulled them out randomly. Um, but it doesn't sound like that. It sounds like this well kind of rehearsed thing. Because yeah. um, w- when I first started out, we'd do live stuff. And it depended on um, the musician I w- was with and how comfortable they would feel. So I'd done it with, you know, I've done it with people playing guitar and drums and bass recorder and flutes and violin. Um, th- that's that's where it kind of started. And yeah, depending on the musician, if, if like there was a musician I knew who might be available I would just kind of get in touch with them and say, oh, do you want to do this thing? And, um, and you know, we're, we're neither of us are going to get paid. We're just going mm. to do like five, 10 minutes and I'm just going to read some poems. And uh, it depends, depended on like their kind of uh, feeling when they came uh, to that event, you know, some of them would be like, oh no, let me hear the poems and, you know, and get an idea of what tune, what notes I'm playing and what kind of melody and, you know, what do you want, what tempo and things like that. And then others we're just happy to just turn up on the night and just go and just slowly kind of go into it whilst I read. And then as I got into it, like they'd kind of pick up or, or off of me. That's really cool. That's, I think is my sort of preference really, because it's just, uh, it's the excitement of just kind of not knowing mm-hmm. where it's going to go and then kind of closing the poem and knowing that, Oh, that, that went well because there's nothing that could go wrong in, in that really. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's just about being confident and because no one's coming to hear you do that and thinking, well, well, no, that the, the music had to go here or there. It, you know, it's just it is a spontaneous exercise. Yeah. Um, but um, um, yeah, I've done some stuff with recordings um, with um, Veneer and Jack Fruit Planet, and they both kind of make experimental kind of electronic kind of soundscapes. So yeah, that just came. I just had a couple of poems. I originally we were going to make videos for them and. The, the videos didn't happen and they, they just made the music they just listened to the poem sorry uh, of me reading the, like recordings of me reading the poems and then they just i let them interpret them mm-hmm. how they wanted to interpret them so um i think it's um there's a recording of zygote poem that incorporated the um recording of my daughter's heartbeat when she was in the womb mm-hmm. yeah. um so i yeah so i uh, so i gave him that sean uh, my friend he's called and um i gave him that 
and I gave him a recording of myself reading the poem so he could hear how I was doing it. And, you know, he could hear what the poem was about when it's the zygote poems about the journey of the zygote through to embryo to fully fleshed baby. So, so yeah, he just kind of took that and interpreted it. Yeah, uh, how he saw fit, and the same, and the same with the other one. I haven't, yeah, I haven't done anything musically for a while. It's just there's not been the opportunity. It's more sort of one of those things which you know, if we're, it's all you know, if we're in the right sphere at the right, yeah. the right yeah. time, sort of thing. Then let's do it. It would be great. I would really love to, because I'm a big um, music fan and I collect records. I would love to sort of do a record, you know. Yeah, but it's just it's finding the time because to do something like that, well, I could do it spontaneous i guess on the spot but it's, it's finding the people that are happy yeah. to happy to do that in the time it's just yeah it's just, yeah just one of those things but yeah we yeah. um we being my acquaintance of mine and i um went and saw k tempest uh a while back and that was phenomenal i mean it was it was unbelievable watching yeah. watching that and that that was such a unique uh experience and and i've i feel like i've been kind of you know it's not the same but um um, and i'm sure gonna mispronounce this but uh uh, sleaford mobs uh or mods uh, like also has been really interesting in terms of the like the textures and uh the delivery and kind of like that unique sound and i think that that's just absolutely fascinating to me and and you know certainly i can't think of there may be artists in the united states that are doing that but not that kind of uh, different in terms of like the the strange you know strange rhythms and like kind of like off kilter like elements and stuff and and just yeah, yeah it's really cool yeah. With that yeah with that stuff it's like really i want to say rehearsed but that might make it sound a bit clinical but it you know you, yeah that kind of stuff they they, they really sort of know where every beat is and where mm-hmm. you know what what the music's doing exactly and that's you you've got to be really sort of in um that kind of focused head state to write stuff like that um but like uh yeah americans i guess there's there's a guy called adam and i'm gonna um mess up his last name i think it's nade or nard it's g-a-d-e but yeah yeah i haven't listened to him in a while but yeah i think he was doing some spoken word stuff um mm-hmm. which was a little bit different um you know in terms of band stuff i i totally forgot i because i put on um gigs for a while like rock gigs mm-hmm. and um for for a while whilst i was getting into poetry i started to mix the two and so we'd have poets uh reading and then we'd have bands and we'd alternate throughout the night and it'd be like rock bands and punk bands and indie bands mm-hmm with um whilst they were setting up we'd have poets reading um and then at the end of the night we did we only did like a few of them but i would then read with whoever was on the bill mm-hmm. um usually it was um on i'd say usually we only did like three of these particular events but two of them it was like an indie band and then there was another one i did with like a punk rock band oh, like a cool. sort of fagazi kind of punk rock band oh nice and that that was interesting the the more indie kind of band um that was more kind of like uh, went into their rehearsal space and it's like All right, what poems you're going to read mm-hmm. let's hear you read them and then they created something kind of in their kind of style um around it and yeah. then with the punk band uh they had a song which they were starting their set with and they were like they're a political band and they said oh uh, we've got this song we'll play the intro like part just over and over you write something to it and i've yeah. not sort of done that before so i had to write something which would go into the rhythm of yeah of that and and would work with that and that was that was really interesting because it was pumped they were so loud and <laughs> it was it was yeah, really really intense and i've never quite done it like that before but it was really, really enjoyable cool. they're called the um the bedroom projects um, who are well worth checking out. Um, they're a Plymouth band which is where I live, and they're sort of one of those criminally, I won't say underrated bands, but just bands that never quite broke out because they had all been in a band before that had gone quite well, uh-huh. done quite well. They'd kind of had their kind of time of like really pushing it, you know, with the music industry. And then this was kind of like their kind of like, oh, we did that. Now we're just going to be in this punk band and it's going to be great, but yeah. we're just going to like, take a step back and just like play a gig here and there and they play like once every five years now and but because of that everybody like goes to the gigs yeah but that was really exciting because they were like one of my a band i looked up to as a musician Mm -hmm. and yeah and it was really fun but like with k tempest and 
Sleaford Mods and those bands who are like doing it like in a band way and like a you know in that kind of setup. I have utmost respect for them um, yeah. um, because it's like you, you've got to be really drilled into into the music. But um, yeah. but then I guess you're rehearsing and everything else. You know, it's not like me. I'm coming along on the night and <laughs> winging it. So I I think like the the there's another like Tom Waits is also like a really good example of someone who I think is has really integrated poetry into yeah. very off kilter kind of absurd and surreal music and and um you know and i think even of his kind of the poetry that he he recites in uh the like the film rumblefish which is like you know which is also very almost very surreal and it's in its own right and so i can <laughs> i i love that the way that that composition works and how um the idea of imp- improvised music accompanying poetry and everything is is really cool to me yeah 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 and then i guess not so surreal but like you know leonard cohen just came mm-hmm. to mind and patty smith um yes. you know, it's obvious yes. uh, i'm not sure why i didn't think of this before um <laughs> But uh, yeah, and Leonard Cohen's, you know, have been a big influence for me. But they, in that sense, yes, yeah, so like poetry and music have always kind of belonged together, really. Mm-hmm. I mean, ly- lyrics are uh, a yeah. yeah, form of poetry in themselves. And then I think of um, bands like Me Without You, mm-hmm. who I'm not sure if you're familiar with, mm-hmm. who's, um, yeah, some of the more spoke, spoke, I mean, his lyrics are po- poetry. They're like some of the most poetic yeah. Kind of yeah. lyrics in that kind of post hardcore punk kind mm-hmm. of scene that he's part of anyway and um i like uh, yeah, uh, those lyrics to be read alone you know um, yeah there's a there's another band uh, another uk band um uh dry cleaning um that i, oh, that I love I really, dry cleaning. Yeah, yeah they're fantastic yeah. Yeah. yeah uh so good and i i yeah, just yeah. find myself just i i love the you know, just almost like this, like the free associative quality of the, the yeah. way that the lyrics are delivered and the, the music yeah. and everything. So, well, that's um, it's interesting because when I first heard dry cleaning, I didn't quite get it. I didn't mind it, but I didn't quite get the hype. And then I watched a performance uh, on TV of them playing at Glastonbury mm-hmm. and like seeing, uh, I've forgotten the lady's name who, um, Who's, who fronts it but um but so seeing them all together but yeah. seeing the way she delivered it in such a, a stoic kind of fashion yeah and just brought it all together and she was like wearing this kind of red dress with her trainers on and like this really straight long hair and yeah. red nails and she was like just she was had like a cassette player uh-huh. i think like a portable one and she just kept hitting play but there was no reason for her to hit play it just there was all these kind of things going on and it sometimes it takes seeing a band live to really kind of click and then yes. after that i went out and bought the record and i bought the following record and I, yeah but uh with dry cleaning then that comes back to that idea of um drawing absurdity from the the mundane yeah i think that's a lot of what she's absolutely doing is like a collage kind of poetry yeah. where she's she keeps notebooks i believe and she would just write fragments down mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, of things uh, that she sees or that she overhears and then she will pull them all together yeah. so you've got this very fragmented kind collage, of collage almost like collage yeah yeah, yeah definitely yeah and then it becomes really absurd because you have her talking about eating a twix in one line and then you know um painting her toenails in, an, in another line and then <laughs> and like someone standing on their head on another line so it's like uh but then we we could um go on and on i guess because then you go back to like david bowie and uh-huh. you know he's kind of using like cut-up method and yeah then to william burroughs and yeah it's absolutely well Richard, this has been um, an absolute delight. Thank you so much for taking the time to to speak yeah, with me, nice. and and um, I'm excited to see more of your work out in the world, and and hopefully at some point uh, we'll be able to cross paths in person, and and which yeah, would yeah. be which would be wonderful. So thank you uh, again for for doing this. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Thank you to Zeno Scott and R.C. Thomas for joining us on this episode. Please be sure to like and subscribe, and if you're enjoying the podcast, leave us a review. 
You can find our most recent and all past issues at brokenlensjournal.com. As a reminder, we accept submissions year-round, so head to the website and submit your work there. Our theme music is composed and was recorded by Art Santora. I'm Adam. And I'm Heather. Thanks for listening. Bye.